Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Andy Linehan, president of the club. Good afternoon. Welcome to our Friday Forum. Welcome to our Friday Forum. We're going to be talking about uh, putting the public back in public education. And our speaker today is Wendy Purifoy, president of the Public Education Network. Before we begin our program, I have our usual uh, items of City Club business. Next Friday, February 13th, Metro Council President David Bragdon joins us to deliver the State of the Region Address, and that will be at the Multnomah Athletic Club. David will talk about reclaiming the marketplace and the politics of innovation in a presentation entitled Beyond 19th Century Government. You can register online at the City Club uh, website, pdx, www.pdxcityclub.org. And while you're at the website, you could also, members can also take advantage of the ability to register online for, the, for Governor Kulongowski's State of the State speech, which will be on March 5th here at the Governor Hotel. And if you do prepay for Governor Kulongowski's speech, we can mail you the tickets so you won't have to stand in line of the, on the day of the event. Um, if you don't have access to the internet, there's a pre-registration form available in your bulletin. But uh, go ahead and register because at last count we had only about 100 tickets left and with a full house we may not even have room for coffee tickets or general seating. So go ahead and uh, register for the State of the State address for March of March 5th. And of course, advance uh, registration of purchase of, of sellout events such as the governor's address is one more reason to become a member of City Club. And if you're not a member yet, there's still time to join and pre-register the State of the State. We have brochures about joining City Club in the lobby, or you can complete your membership online at our website. I'd also like to call your attention to City Club the City Club Research Board's community scan activity, which is an effort to gather suggestions for future study and program topics from both City Club members and the community in general. If you've ever said to yourself, this is what City Club really ought to be looking at, or this topic would make a great Friday forum presentation, well, this is your chance to suggest your top two local or regional issues of public importance. You'll find cards on all your tables that give you instructions on how to submit your ideas, or again, you can do it through our website. I'd like to make a special welcome uh, to our group of high school leaders from across the city who are sitting with us at various tables today. And I want to thank their uh, sponsors, Steve Schell and David Newhall of Black Helter Line. So welcome to you all of you today. I'd also li like to welcome uh, a number of, uh, of uh, leaders we have in our midst. Congressman David Wu is here with us, welcome. Multnomah County Chair Diane Lin, uh, Portland Schools Board member Lorenzo Poe, welcome to all of you. Um, I'd also like to welcome the members of the uh, Portland Schools Foundation or, who are here and who have spent uh, much of the last week with our speaker, Wendy Purifoy. So welcome and thanks for coming. We also have a new member, Khalid Wahab. Uh, Khalid, welcome. I think you're, if you're there, stand up and we'll say hello. <laughs> there he is. Khalid is a recent uh, graduate in public health from, uh, with a master's degree in public health from Portland State University. So welcome broadcast of City Club programs this quarter is made possible in part by corporate underwriting from the following Pacific Corps, CH2M Hill, and Schwabe, Williamson, and Wyatt. We are very grateful for their support. The last few years have been particularly tough for public schools in Oregon. This week's vote on ballot measure 30 has, has even been interpreted by some as in part a vote of no confidence in Oregon's public schools. For many Portland area school districts, the precarious status of our public schools is a relatively new phenomenon. For so many years, we boasted of, of having some of Oregon's best public schools and a very high level of public support for them. However, Oregon's public school challenges are hardly unique to this state, and they are faced in one form or another by many public school systems across the country. Our speaker today, Wendy D. Purifoy, is uniquely positioned to bring a national perspective about the, about the challenges facing public schools in America. Ms. Purifoy has been president of the Public Education Network, or PEN, the nation, nation's largest network of community-based school reform projects since PEN was founded in 1991. Under her leadership, PEN has grown into a national network of local education funds reaching 11 million children in 1,220 school districts and 16,700 schools nationwide. Ms. Purifoy has been deeply involved in school reform since the 1970s, when she served as a special monitor of the court-ordered desegregation plan at, in uh, Boston's public schools. 
She's also a noted leader in, in the philanthropic world. Prior to becoming president of Penn, Ms. Purifoy was executive vice president and chief operating officer of the Boston Foundation, which is a community foundation with an endowment of over $750 million supporting public health, welfare, educational, cultural, environmental, and housing programs in Boston. Ms. Purifoy serves on the boards of numerous national organizations, including Demos, Hasbro's Children's Foundation, Learning Matters, Inc., Local Initi Initiative Support Corporation, and the National Center for Family Philanthropy. Ms. Purifoy holds a bachelor's degree from William Smith College and holds three Master's of Arts degrees in African American Studies, American Studies, and American Colonial History from Boston University. Welcome, Ms. Purifoy. Thank you. You actually end up with all those degrees because you never finish your PhD. <laughs> and instead, they give you a few consolation prizes. I am very pleased uh, to be here. I'm always pleased to be in Portland. It's a great city. It's a beautiful city. And I am delighted to be back here again. So distinguished members of the City Club, I want to thank you for inviting me, and Portland School Board members, and. Multnomah County Chair Diane Lynn and U.S. Congressman Wu, and the high school leaders that are here today, welcome, and we're all proud of you and support your work, and to all of the advocates who support quality public education here in Portland, I'm glad you came, and to all the PFATters, and Principal for a Day people who were out yesterday in the schools uh, for the Principal for a Day program, which was quite extraordinary. So. I just want to thank you all for taking time out of your busy day uh, to come and spend time together. You have to admit, it's actually been a pretty exciting week, and Andy talked about it when he uh, did his introduction. But this Tuesday, voters in about seven states exercised their rights as citizens and voted for presidential candidates they felt would best lead our country in these troubled times. In the process, they crushed the political aspirations of some and sent those of others soaring. Here in Oregon, voters had to decide once again whether they were going to support Measure 30. And of course, now the voters have said no. And Oregon is faced with some pretty difficult choices, particularly for public education. Sorry. Let's face it, democracy is a pretty messy business. The issues are complicated, the choices are difficult, but we the people must choose. That is the right given to us in our Constitution. It is the right that Americans have handed down throughout history, and we have fought for it and died for it. That is the most fundamental, most sacred tenet of our democratic process, that we, we the people, get to choose. The issues facing us in this election year are complicated. The choices are stark, and the implications are far-reaching, and yet we must choose. We must listen to all the words, read between the lines, weigh all the rhetoric against the facts, use our critical thinking skills that our public schools are teaching us or have taught us, and then go and cast our votes for those who best represent our wishes. For the great majority of Americans, their journey as citizens in the participatory democracy process begins with the education they receive in America's public schools. From the founding of the Republic to the present day, Americans of all stripes and stations have worked tirelessly to establish, to define, and to provide a system of public education that will benefit the people and the nation. From all of these efforts, some brilliant, some foolhardy, to establish, reform, and restructure America's public schools, one inescapable lesson emerges. A knowledgeable and engaged public that demands educational opportunity for every child is essential if we are to achieve the goal of an educated citizenry with the capacity to manage and maintain 
America's democratic way of life. The quality of public education in America rests in our hands, in our ability to value its benefits to our society, and in our willingness to extend those benefits and take responsibility for ensuring that quality public education exists for every child in every community across our nation. Every generation of Americans has wrestled with this challenge. Today, especially, it is critical that Americans be well-educated, given the inexorable forces of globalization, our rapidly changing demographics, and the complex interplay and impact of domestic and international policies that demand higher levels of knowledge and skills from us as citizens, as voters, and as workers, which makes quality public education for all children an even greater imperative for America in the 21st century. The combination of these awesome, powerful forces calls for a new civil rights movement that secures for public education the unequivocal status as the fundamental underpinning of a democratic civil society and further extends to all children in America not only access to public education, but the guarantee of a quality public education as a civil right. How can we attain the goal that so many generations of Americans have struggled to realize? How can we instill the urgency and the responsibility to provide the kind of public education that fulfills the democratic ideals espoused by our founding fathers and captured in the Declaration of Independence and the preamble to the Constitution of the United States? So what I'd like to discuss with you today is the role of citizens and the role of public engagement in securing a system of public education that serves our communities, our nations, and all Americans effectively and equitably. We not only need to do this for ourselves, but as a superpower in the world, and as the world's sole superpower, the rest of the world wants us to do this as well. The concepts that gave rise to public education in our country have their genesis in the mid-17th century as Europeans fled to the New World in search of religious freedom and economic opportunity. These twin pursuits have evolved across the centuries into our present free market system in which we individuals are largely responsible for ourselves and to our democratic ideals in which we as a society take collective responsibility for one another. The tensions these pursuits produce, while often sometimes conflicting and unsettling, has to a great degree been responsible for Amer many of America's dilemmas and challenges, but for much of our strength and our power. Beliefs about public education formed during our early national period have proven to be resilient and influential in the nation's calculus. Two in particular remain with us today. The first is that the people should be educated, followed closely by the second, that by educating people, they would become loyal to the nation and the nation would benefit and prosper. While Thomas Jefferson's beliefs about public education for the common man are usually cited to justify America's belief in universal public education, it was actually John Adams of Massachusetts who championed public responsibility for public education along with the necessity of education for the masses. And he said, the education of a nation, instead of being confined to a few schools and universities for the instruction of the few, must become the national care and expense for the formation of the many. A hundred years later, Horace Mann admonished the 1859 graduating class of Antioch College to be ashamed to die before you have won some victory for humanity. Widely regarded as the father of public education, Mann spent most of his life working to ensure free public education for every American because he believed that it was possible, that it was essential, and that it was right. 
Adams and Mann gave explicit voice to implicitly held beliefs that the education of the nation's people was a public responsibility to be shared by the people, to be governed by the people, to be financed by the people for the benefit of the people and the nation. That forms the architecture for the nation's debates about schooling and supplies the lore that holds together the compact of public education and democracy. As a historian, I've spent a great deal of time looking back at the early days of how did this system of public education get started? Isn't it written somewhere in the Constitution since we're so dependent upon an educated citizenry to keep our democracy? Surely it must be someplace in the founding documents of this nation that public education sits at the core of our democracy and therefore is a fundamental civil right. Well, it's not there, but it certainly was very much a part of the founding fathers' thinking. They had the same debates that we have today. Should there be a national curriculum? What is it that children should learn? Who should be educated? How well should they be educated? Uh, who pays for it? Under whose control does this come? Those were the same debates that we have continued today. One of the streams that fed this debate about who should be educated, why should they be educated, also ran alongside of this issue of citizenship. So as we began to expand our definitions of citizenship, we also began to expand our beliefs about who should be educated and who should not be educated and to what degree they ought to be educated. And so as I read these early documents, I am struck by the contours of the debate and how it's almost eerie how the debate remains the same. What is the purpose of public education? Who should be educated? What should students learn? How much education is needed? How should the system be organized? Who pays for education? Who should be held accountable? And what should we expect a system of education to produce for the individual, their community, and the nation? A part of the reason why these debates were going on was because we were trying to form a nation. But the other part of the reason why these debates were going on is because of the presence of slavery, because of the presence of indentured servants, and because we had, in these early days of putting the republic together, we had some difficulty deciding who was and who was not a citizen, who could be educated and who could not be educated. But this, this stream, this issue of race, was there in the beginning. In fact, many of the southern states chose not to have a system of public education, a widespread system of public education, because they were concerned not about educating slaves. That was clear. They had laws against that. But they were concerned about white laborers, that if white laborers became too well educated, they might not want to serve in the agrarian system in the way that they did. So I think one of the things that we have to uh, recognize is that what we're grappling with in our system today are some unresolved conflicts that have been with us from the very beginning. Nonetheless, the belief in the value of public education is deeply ingrained in the American psyche. It defines who we are as a people and what we are as a nation. Our democracy could not exist without educated citizens to protect it. Citizens who are able to read, able to analyze, able to understand, and able to fully participate. Citizens with a way of life they cherish, with rights they value, and with a future that they're willing to fight for. Yet far too many children in this country do not get the education they need to be productive citizens. Far too many do not get the education they need to prosper in a knowledge-driven economy. And far too many do not get the education they need to reach their full potential as human beings. Now, it would be the greatest of hubris on our part to somehow conclude that we wouldn't be needing the contributions of these children. That in a world filled with war, with terrorism, with religious conflict, ethnic strife, implacable disease, and fierce economic competition, 
we have the luxury of discounting, of dismissing the potential of a single one of these children sitting in our classrooms today. Yet we systematically discount the potential of thousands of children in this country every day. And we do it through a system of public education that accepts achievement gaps, that tolerates inequitable funding systems, that makes do with deteriorating buildings and outdated textbooks, and that defends failing schools and substandard teaching. It is shameful that these conditions exist anywhere in America because we know what it takes to help all children learn. We know children need qualified teachers, capable school leaders like we saw yesterday uh, in our Principal for a Day program, supportive learning environments, adequate resources, high expectations linked to standards, and fair diagnostic assessments. We've known this for quite some time. The last 10 years of the school reform movement have really helped us to understand the critical elements of what it takes to help children achieve and to close the achievement gap. We know all of this, yet once we get into the realm of high standards for all children, once we commit to doing everything we can to closing the achievement gap, then we are in the business of fomenting a revolution. Because when standards-based reform entered the classrooms of America, it not only began to change student outcomes, it began to change the course of civilization. Dramatic hyperbole? Well, I don't think so. Most people in the world have followed what their fathers and mothers did. Most of us believed that some people were born to rule and some people were born to follow the rulers, that some people had innate intelligence and some people do not. I don't think that's true. And you today don't think that's true. And part of the reason why we don't think that's true is because the standards-based reform movement has come along and said, all children can learn and learn at high levels. It has been accompanied by a lot of research on brain development, and now we know that poten human potential is limitless. I first became involved in public school reform in the early 70s when I worked for Judge Arthur Garrity on the desegregation of the Boston Public Schools. Over those, beginning in those years and today, I have been struck repeatedly by con the difficulty we continue to face in helping to shift not only the public school culture, but our national culture from one where we expect some children to do well to one where we expect all children to do well. But now we have standards-based reform, and standards-based reform says that all children can and should learn at high levels, and this belief that all children can learn at high levels is as bold a concept as that put forward in the Declaration of, the, of Independence, that all men are created equal, or the concept of justice embodied in the Emancipation Proclamation, that all persons held as slaves shall be then, thenceforward, and forever free, or in the women's suffrage movement that says the United States recognizes the right of women to vote and stand for election. These words represent cosmic shifts in our lives, and in many ways, we are still grappling with the changes these words unleashed. Now, standards-based reform presents us with another profound turning point in our civilization. Now we are saying that for America to fulfill its promise, all children must have the opportunity to reach their God-given potential. Now we are saying that human potential is fluid and not fixed. We are like Queen Isabella when she sent Columbus out to find a new world, believing that the world was flat. His return confirmed that the world was round. Human potential is fluid, not fixed. And that means that the public schoolhouse door must truly be the door of opportunity for every child in America. 
Now we are taking a journey of change, one step at a time, one school at a time, one district at a time, one community at a time. We have established standards and we are implementing them. We are identifying the levers that make the greatest difference in student achievement. We are developing a better understanding of the resiliency of school systems and we are developing a better understanding of their resistance and our resistance to change. I want to take a minute and talk about this resistance to change and the attitudes that keep us from achieving our goals. Because this resistance and these attitudes exist in each and every one of us. And unless we acknowledge this and address it, we won't be able to fix it. So here's what I think the biggest stumbling block to the progress we need to make in order to close the achievement gap. Somehow, somewhere along the way, it happens in our daily practices. It's an idea that has crept into our collective DNA. It began with slavery. We have not rooted it out. An idea that says that some children can succeed and others cannot. That some children want to learn and others do not. That some have parents who can support them to learn and some do not. That what happens in the classroom can reach some children but not others. And we have concrete examples all over this country in Portland, in places, in schools in Portland and places all over this country that are contrary to that belief. We have children from single parent poor families meeting and closing the achievement gaps in their schools. It's happening in some places, and yet we struggle to take it to scale. What's the difference between those schools that succeed and those that don't? Well, we talked about it. Some of us experienced that yesterday when we went on the Principal for a Day program. Schools that have a clear a plan to close the achievement gap, that have quality teachers, that have an instructional set of programs, that have fair and diagnostic tests, that look at those tests and make real assessments. But they also have the supports of communities. But the biggest thing that makes the difference is the expectations that we have of those children. They have changed the mindset that doubts the children's innate ability to learn because they knew that that shameful mindset was condemning thousands of children to lives of poverty, lives without hope, and lives at the margin. Until recently, these deeply ingrained attitudes about children and learning went unchallenged, but we have standards-based reform as our companion. We used to turn to courts, Brown versus the Board of Education, the Abbott decision, the campaign for fiscal equity case in New York recently, and of course the famous decision in Kentucky, which ruled in favor of adequacy and equity. Courts can make decisions, but we have to carry those decisions out. So what about Oregon? Where do things stand here in Oregon, and more specifically in Portland? I said this to the Principal for a Day people yesterday. I love Portland. It's a great city. I start my uh, summer vacations in Portland. I have a brother who's mentally retarded, and we start driving down the coast. We both fly into Portland, we meet each other, and we drive from Portland all the way down to San Francisco. So Portland holds a very special place for me. When I come here, I feel energized, and I feel inspired, and I feel filled with the sense of what is possible. I feel that I'm in a close-knit community. You meet somebody in the hallway, and then they come and tell you, I may have to leave early, but I want you to know uh, I didn't, uh, it's not disrespectful to you. This sense of being connected, of being in a community, is what I love about Portland. Now, I know that we all have our problems in Portland and in other places. But I also love Portland for that saying, I believe it's on the side of your courthouse, that the sea of liberty is never without a wave. And somehow, I always try to find a way to kind of drive past there when I'm here. Well, you have waves, and some of you have experienced this this week and last year. Some of them are pretty big. 
You have to hire a superintendent. You have to deal with the requirements of no child left behind. You have to transform your high schools. But most importantly, you have an achievement gap to close. But you have some fantastic resources here in Portland as well. The citizens in Multnomah County, I've been practicing saying that word, Multnomah, <laughs> have passed the measure 2648. You can't imagine how people around the country cheered when you did that. What an incredible example to the rest of the world. You should be a product. You have a fabulous school board. You have a great business community. You have a fantastic philanthropic community. And you have my favorite, the Portland Schools Foundation. I think Portland is well positioned to tackle the hard work that lies ahead. And it is very hard work because there are two gaps. There is the achievement gap and there's the public responsibility gap. And we talked about it yesterday, which is how do we get from knowing that we should have high expectations for all children. We go into a school and we see how teachers and principals are working to make those high expectations real for kids, that kids are achieving, but then they go to school in buildings that many of us went to school in 20 and 30 years ago. They go to school in, sometimes in neighborhoods where all the people are not employed. They go to school with teachers who may be there this year or not next year. Now, you took that instability out of your system, but in many places, as we now know, through the failure of Measure 30, many children in Oregon will go to school with that instability. So we know that children need quality instruction. They need an environment conducive to learning. They need accountability and authority aligned to standards, resources to support the standards, and non-academic supports that enhance learning. But, a big but, in addition to that, they need a knowledgeable and engaged community that will stand for these children every time because they know what it takes, they're willing to do what it takes, and they follow through. There's been great progress made in the work of what has to go on inside of schools. But in order to accomplish that work, there's work that has to go on outside of schools. So the Public Education Network, about four years ago, actually based upon the model of the work that the Portland Schools Foundation has done here, began to look at public engagement, the kind of public engagement that can build a knowledgeable community, help them be able to sustain good policy and practices over time, and have them, that community of citizens be there when the superintendent changes and the school board changes and the teachers come and go. There is this community of people who've been living in their houses 10, 20, 30 years. So what does this structure of public engagement look like? Well, it has three key qualities to it. It's intentional, that is that it has a theory and it has a set of targets around it. It's systemic, it means that it's working through all populations. And it's sustained, which is that we have to keep it going over time. We looked at three groups. We looked at the public at large, we've looked at policymakers and stakeholders. And we developed various strategies for each of these groups. The sum total of this work is really pretty basic, helping people to know basic information about the schools, helping people to be able to engage around a policy change that would make a difference in the schools and what that policy change will result in, and then having people be able to stay the course in terms of what's happened over time. We call this work reviving relationship, restructuring hope, and reclaiming voice. It turns out that we all throw off inspiration as somebody has been very inspiring or help us be hopeful. But it turns out inspiration and hope have a structure. And that structure is embedded in public engagement. 
the capacity for citizens to develop knowledge, to act on that knowledge, and to remain involved and sustained. This is what we have been doing at the Public Education Network, very much based upon what we learned from Portland. As a part of our work, we also developed a list of 10 indicators to help communities rate their readiness to improve educational outcomes in their public schools. So as I go down this list, I think that you will see that Portland fares well on some and not so well on others, and so I would like you to think about that. What level of leadership do elected officials provide to the issue of public education? Whether they are uh, sitting on the school board or not sitting on the school board, whether they are at the state level or at the local level, what's the leadership role that all of our elected officials are playing around education? What's voter turnout for school board elections when it isn't connected to uh, uh, the, the national election cycle? Now, I can tell you that in most communities, it's around 6%. Uh, I know it was much higher here for Measure 2638. I think it was somewhere around 44%. That's astounding. Uh, keep that up in a, in a year when you're not connected to another larger cycle. Active parent organizations have been important, a very active business community, a business community that is not afraid to both point out the issues of where the school system may not be measuring up, but also remains the companion to the school system as they make changes. That's been very important. The knowledge of school performance data, how many people in our communities are very satisfied to say, oh, the schools are just not doing a good job, there's a huge achievement gap, and oh well, what can I do about it? Most people don't know the information about school performance data, and now there's an opportunity because of No Child Left Behind for people to know that data. What's the community's commitment to diversity? A very, very important factor. If people can see children from all walks of life achieving and achieving at high levels, they know they have a healthy system. What's the media coverage of education issues? Three cheers to the Oregonian who uh, has, I know, over three reporters working on education. Um, there are very few papers across the country that have actually kept a single uh, education reporter focused on education. But, and most people gather their news about the schools from three places. The teachers, the kids, word of mouth, uh, at a fourth, and the newspapers. And so it's pretty important that the newspapers and that the media, uh, both print and um, television and radio media know the issues and report to the community because people get their information from you. Strong civic organizations. It's pretty hard to have good healthy schools if you don't have a network of civic organizations that are working in a variety of different ways to improve the community. Youth involvement. It was great to hear the uh, Andy make the announcement that young people are here uh, at this meeting, but youth involvement is very important. Children experiencing democracy in their communities and in their schools makes for better future citizens. Partnerships with institutions of higher education. One of the things that is critically important to the teacher quality uh, efforts that are going on around the country is the linkage with higher education institutions who really help to prepare teachers in their higher education institutions for real life schooling in the public schools. That's a very important part. Finally, what's important is support for resources. People say, well, it can't just be the money. No, it isn't just the money. We know how the money should be applied now. And so money aligned with the things that we know makes a difference makes a difference. And schools that don't have the resources cannot do the job. It's as simple as that. We know where to put the money, and we know that we need the money. So that's an important part of our index. So why have we focused so much on public responsibility? Because in the end, the public schools are the public schools. And if you have high achieving schools, it's because the public has that expectation. And if we have low achieving schools, it's because the public has that expectation. But 
We go to the public because it's sort of like what Willie Sutton, the bank robber, once said. Uh, that's where the money is. If we want our schools to improve and if we want our children to learn, we have to harness the power of public will. I must tell you I find myself worried about our ability to keep the public engaged. I worry about our seemingly inexorable march toward privatization and special interest in this country. I worry about the serious ramifications this has for our democratic way of life and for our public schools. So what do I mean when I say that our public schools are being privatized? They are being privatized when school children have to pay to ride the school bus or to participate in school activities, when parents have to donate money to pay for teachers' salaries, when public funds are drained out of the system by ill-conceived voucher plans, when corporations buy ad space in school buses and cafeterias, when the public schools must sign exclusive beverage contracts in order to cover their operating costs, and this is happening in too many schools, and when public schools are named after the biggest donor. I remember when I went into my public school, the Yaden Public School, which had a subtitle, the Oliver Wendell Holmes Public School. It was a beautiful school. People died and left some of their art collections to that school. It was the best looking building in town because it was the public school. It was the best maintained building in town because it was a public place and we wanted people to be proud of it. So I worry about that privatization. I worry about the fact that we live in compartmentalized private ways every day. Each of us can go through a set of interactions and never connect with our fellow citizens. We can go to our ATM machine, we can get on our computers alone, we can book our plane tickets alone, we can pay our bills alone, we can do all those things by ourselves and yet, it takes each and every one of us in a group to create a democracy, which we all enjoy living in. So we have to seize the moment and change the world for every single student in this country, in this city, that is stuck in a low performing school. We must take the knowledge of what works and apply it to every school in this country and to every child in this country. And if we're going to succeed in this business, it can't be business as usual. We have to change the way we think, and we have to change the way we operate, and we have to be willing to take action. Change occurs in this country when people are moved to action by injustice. Now what could be possibly more unjust than condemning a child to a second-rate education because of their zip code the income of their parents, the color of their skin. Change occurs in this country when someone points out an injustice and says, this will not stand. When someone mobilizes citizens to take action. So we must mobilize and we must act to achieve the change we want to achieve quality education for all children. There are tremendous resources available in this nation but ultimately, the quality of education delivered in Portland public schools is up to you because there is simply no substitute for no greater power than the force of public will. You saw what you did with Tax Measure 2638. So if you, the people of Portland, insist on a quality public education for all children in this city, then all children in this city will receive a quality public education. I'd like to end my remarks today with a story that the late Al Shanker used to tell about finding solutions to difficult problems. And once he died, um, many people were saying, okay, Al, you told this story. We hope you're up there thinking about us. But here's what the story is. He used to say, well, God is approached by a group of people asking for his help. God listens to their concerns and then ask, well, do you want the ordinary solution or an extraordinary one? And people think it over for a minute and then they reply. They say, well, we're just ordinary people, so we'll take the ordinary solution. 
And with that, the sky opens up and a host of angels descend to assist them in their tasks, sending qualified teachers, highly instructional leaders, all the resources that they need all across the country to do this work of school reform. Well, the people are stunned and overwhelmed. And finally, one asks God, well, if this is the ordinary solution, what's the extraordinary one? And God replies, oh, the people do it themselves. I wish you the greatest success in your extraordinary solutions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wendy. As you know, City Club members have the privilege of asking questions of our speakers, uh, but we'll also, I'd also like to extend that uh, privilege to our high school visitors today. And those of you who are not City Club members, it's not too late to join. Um, our first question will come from our board host, Carol Witherell. She's a professor of education at Lewis and Clark College. She's also been a longtime City Club member, and she's co-chaired our Education and Human Development Issue Committee uh, for two terms. So after Carol's asked her question, Others of you can ask questions. Please identify yourselves as City Club members. Limit your questions to 30 seconds. And remember, these are questions, and I will remind you of that if necessary. So thank you. Thank you, Wendy, for your inspiring remarks. Here's my question. When educational reform efforts hang their aims primarily on high-stakes testing, sometimes mindless testing, ignoring other more robust and informative measures of student learning, and when there's inadequate resources for teachers and students to implement reform efforts, can they actually hinder rather than help in closing the achievement gap? Everybody knows there's this huge debate going on about high-stakes testing. Um, I would say that n none of the reformers believe in high-stakes testing. The standards-based reform movement has been set up. And as we looked at it, one of the things that was clear clearly important was for children to have multiple ways in which they could demonstrate their uh, capacity uh, and development of knowledge. So high-stakes testing doesn't help. On the other hand, it's important for people to hear the tests matter. And they matter a lot, particularly for uh, children to be able to know how they're doing and for the school to know what it is that children don't know and therefore what can they do to help children achieve. What doesn't happen often enough is that the tests are given in October, you don't get the results until the following October, the kids out of the grade for which you were testing them on the material, and of course it can't be used as a diagnostic tool. That's not helpful at all. So that's one problem. We have to really sort of close the, the, the feedback loop that testing can help us with. The second is that the kind of testing that tells us more about what children know and don't know and can act as a diagnostic tool are often not multiple choice tests. They are uh, tests that are much more complex to administer and they are tests that are more expensive to administer. And so that's another area that we, um, I think, have to think about. That's, you know, when, when people say, why do we have to spend more money? Well, this would be one of the things. And in fact, if we spent uh, appropriate dollars, uh, dollars on appropriate assessments, we'd have a better feedback loop, which could really help us with, with closing um, the achievement gap. I think that teaching to the test has two uh, aspects to it. In some places, the tests are good. The state test is good. And so teaching to that test in some states, if the test is aligned with standards, it's a pretty good test and it would be helpful. In other places where the test has nothing to do with what the kids are learning, it's very damaging and it's just not helpful. Now all of this, you know, when I stand up here and say this, this is pretty common sense stuff. And yet we have systems that are just grinding out 
uh, their assessment process in the ways that they've done it before. And so we've got standards-based reform taking place on one hand, and we have the system of old testing taking place on the other hand. And we really have got to bring a, a halt, more of an alignment between these two systems so that they can work more effectively together. Now, No Child Left Behind has us on this cycle of, of assessments. And people are deeply concerned about that because that translates to how schools are ranked and rated. And then it also links into uh, the um, ranking of the school, either the school has met standards or it's below standards. And then, of course, the choice provisions kick in. Now, in Portland, the choice provisions work. They're, they're places where children who are in low-performing schools can opt out of those low-performing schools and choose to go into another school, and there are other schools for them to go to. I can tell you that in a city like Philadelphia or in a place like Baltimore or in many other places, that choice provision means absolutely nothing. So, uh, also, let me make one final statement. I think the testing piece is, is also has other ramifications because it translates into uh, a news article or a radio story that, said, that starts to label a school a failing school. Now, some of us may think and it, that it, that's a good thing. And in, in some ways, we have to know if a school is failing. And we have to be prepared to do something about it. But if we label a school a failing school, and then we do nothing about it, then the children who are in that school feel like they're going to a failing school and nobody's going to do anything about it. It's just a failing school. So, much longer answer, but. Chris Smith, club member. Uh, one of the things you said is an identifiable characteristic of a successful school is it has the support of its community. Uh, I want to go back in history a little bit. A decade and a half ago, uh, Oregon passed Measure 5, which shifted funding of schools to the income tax, which I think most of the people in this room would agree was disastrous. Uh, but also did something that I think most of those people in the room would think is a good idea. It equalized funding around the state so that richer districts shift money to poorer districts so we get a, a, relatively, level, uh, a relatively level level of funding for schools around the state. Uh, fast forward 14 years, uh, equalization has proven to be a race to the bottom. And Multnomah County, uh, and thankfully through the leadership of people like Diane Lynn who's here, uh, addressed our local problem with 2648, but in the rest of the state, uh, we still have a huge problem. Is equalization a good thing because it levels resources, or a bad thing because it breaks that link between the community and their schools? Those are not very good choices. <laughs> <laughs> I think there are people who are much more knowledgeable about Oregon's equalization measures um, than I am, but let, let me make this comment. What's beneath the equalization measure is the issue that some schools have huge amounts, the discrepancy between what one school has to work with to meet standards, state standards, and what another school has to work with to meet state standards. So the built-in inequities of schools being dependent uh, upon um, real estate tax, in part, for their funding. So what people were trying to get at, of course, is to try to, you know, equalization is a, uh, a rough tool to try to get at a very complex problem, which is how do we ensure that all schools in a community have at least the level of funding that we know every school must have in order for those children to reach high standards. So the rough tool we chose to use was this e these equalization measures. The bigger issue that I think we have to deal with is what is the financing of schools? How is that financing of schools linked to outcomes that we expect those schools to produce? And therefore, will every school have access to the resources in order to do that? Now, what, what communities might want to do above that may become 
what that community chooses to do. But here's an example. In Philadelphia, they uh, at one point were spending, I think it was $4,300 per child. You go six blocks outside of the city of Philadelphia and it takes you into a suburban uh, community that borders the city. They were spending $1,200 more per child. You go a little bit further out, I grew up just near Radnor, Pennsylvania, they were spending three times that amount per child, all of them having to meet the same state standards. Now, which one do you think is gonna do better? Well, we know that. So the, the issue I think that we have to grapple with here is what is the structure of resources and how much do we need to help schools reach the level that we want those children to be educated to, to meet state standards, to be proficient, and how are we going to work through our state and federal uh, and county systems to ensure that those resources are there. Uh, Paul Leisner, City Club member and parent of a first grader in the Portland Public Schools. Uh, there are education researchers out there like Clarence uh, Stone and Paul Hill who have talked about a lot of the things that you're talking about saying that um, the really sustained, meaningful reform that's deep and throughout a system systemic uh, almost never happens. We have gimmicks which are testing or charters, vouchers, professional development that different districts try at different times and they're, they rise up for and are supported for a few years and then they're, they sort of drift away. And uh, so I had a question. Uh, which is a city in the United States, the district that comes closest to achieving what you've described, the more the deeper and more sustained uh, change that you're asking about. And my second question is here in Portland, I'm, I'm a little concerned because we do have elected officials that'll step up on the funding issue. They'll be there at the 11th hour on funding, but they haven't been playing a big role as some other mayors have been around the country, other elected officials. The business community hasn't been as engaged as it should be. And I think only 20% of the f uh, households in Portland now have kids, and that number is dropping. So even though there are a lot of good things about Portland, and we have a great history of civic engagement, what would your advice be to deal with some of those, uh, those kind of obstacles? Well, I, my remarks were going a, a little bit longer than I had hoped they would, but one of the things around engagement that is really important is there needs to be uh, an intermediary or a set of intermediary organizations. Uh, and it's part of what I talked about in this index. Um, the members of the public education network of which the Portland Schools Foundation is one, they're known as local education funds. Engagement has got to be somebody's business. Uh, the structure of engagement has to be somebody's business. Helping people to know information, helping people to use that information, helping people to make meaning of that information, and then to help people take action around that information in relationship to the goals that the community has outlined. So one is there's a very big importance to the role of these intermediary organizations like the Portland Schools Foundation and other nonprofits that, that have been in the city that have been focused on how do you help people um, be engaged, be knowledgeable, and then act upon it. Um, I think one of the, the, there are several communities, in fact, that have been making a great deal of progress around holding their school boards, holding their public officials accountable. I, you know, you and I don't in agree entirely. I'm not a resident of Portland, so you know it a lot better than I do. But I certainly remember coming to Portland a few years ago, and um, the issues that of funding loomed large in the state, and for this community to take on that issue and address it was a significant uh, now, it's going to have to continue to address it in some way or another because that measure, I believe, lasts for three years. So, you know, this long-term financing of schools is a, is a bigger critical issue. But there are many communities who are not stepping up to the plate on even the, the funding issue. I think that the, the business communities across the country that have had people in the business community who have actually either gone to the school system that they are attempting to help uh, and feel and understand the role of the schools in the quality of the 
of community life also with the corporate, their corp sense of corporate social responsibility. Uh, I think Portland has been uh, very good in, in that respect, but we have other communities across the country. Um, but what has disturbed this relationship between the business community and its schools have been the uh, forces of globalization. So you have more companies gobbling up other companies, and so you have now, in a place like Boston, for example, where you had 25 companies that the headquarters of those companies were in the city of Boston, and all of those people who were uh, CEOs of those companies actually went to the Boston Public Schools, you probably now have two companies left in that city. So one of the things that we have to look at is what does the structure of corporate social responsibility look like now in the face of globalization where you don't have home-based companies anymore? How do we build the relationship between the business community and the sense of responsibility no matter where you're headquartered? What is the sense of responsibility that a business, uh, uh, that a corporation has for the community in which it's operating? So that's one of the tensions that I think um, that we're dealing with, which is, a, which is a huge one. I'm not sure that I completely answered your question, but those are some thoughts. You know, we've uh, reached the end of our usual hour, but obviously there's a lot of interest, so what I'd suggest is that uh, those of you who have to leave, please feel free to leave. The recording will have stopped by now, but why don't we take the questions from the folks who are still standing, but please keep them quick and to the point, and that'll give our speaker a chance to respond. It would help respond. if I were quicker, too. No, we'd, we'd like to hear you. <laughs> Lois Levine, City Club member. Um, I'm part of a city club group.